Greetings and salutations to our fine podcast audience. Welcome to episode 157. We made it. Yes, we did. Here we are. It is a uh, month of February, and I asked I asked Ed a few days ago. I was like, "You believe we did over 150 of these?" It, I just don't know. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why you asked me that either. I, I don't know. I just I just I just didn't think when we started out this thing we'd be still doing this. But here we are. We're still doing it. Still answering your questions. Oh yes. Okay, I got it now. You got it. Yeah, we're You're still with us, at Ed? it. We're still at it. We're still at, at it. it. Yeah. I think yeah. when we stop. We should always stop when there's one question left in the bank and just tell them, we have one more question next week, but then never fail. Never answer, answer it. it. That poor person. Uh, just never get their question answered. They'll just have to deal have to, with it. They'll have to find a better person to answer their questions. Well, that ain't You that probably ain't should have hard. already done that. Yeah, yeah. That, that, please, exactly. go find somebody. So today we have a question about prayer, as I teased on our last episode. And so I'm going to read the question exactly as it was asked. Here it is. Can you please help me with Mark chapter 11, verse 24, which says, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Those are the words of Jesus. The question goes on. I know we shouldn't just pick a verse at random. However, this was a part of my daily devotional, and so I want to understand. They they made me pick it at random. They did. (laughs) And I want to understand more about what this verse really means. Well, that's good. I've written a devotional to in my life, and uh, that's what you do. You pick a verse. Pick a verse. (laughs) You pick a verse, pull it right out of context. But let me say say that I'm I'm going to just just go on on a limb here and say this person has probably heard us talk before because they know that we are going to talk about context. Yeah, context matters, and that's that's how that's what matters when you're trying to understand what a single verse in the Bible. Because the truth is, there are no single verses; they are connected right. to other things. And you're correct for uh, making that point. This is a verse that somebody plucked out and probably put in your devotional, but there's a lot of stuff going on. Well, and I'll also say that maybe when we talk about context, the chapter context of this may not help, and because we're talking about prayer. And prayer has a lot of mystery associated with it. Mm. Even understanding everything the Bible tells us about prayer may not completely get you to the answer that you want to get to. Mm. Uh, And and I'm not saying you have a pre-planned answer you want to get to. Mm. Do you think it's like this this hit me? And I've I've thought this before when I've talked to people about prayer, because I agree, prayer, in my experience, prayer as an invitation is not a subject that I can learn about. It is in it, even Jesus, a lot of the things Jesus said, which is about prayer, and I think it's why, and there are different denominations that take more things Jesus said, certain literally, than other denominations, and I mean different parts of it. Some people think you have to pray the Lord's Prayer word for word. Some people think, well, this is just the format. Some people take, you know, certain things like this and say, you got to pray in a certain way in Jesus name to make this. And I think it's because part of what this is, is we think when Jesus is teaching about prayer, he's trying to show me, hey, this is what prayer is. This is how it works. This is what it does. Here's Mm -hmm. how you do it. Whereas I think what Jesus is doing is saying, and almost, and I would say, this is probably me exaggerating, most of Jesus' teachings about prayer are, you should do it. Most of Jesus' oh, prayers yeah. are, you should do it, not stop. You should do it and ask in my name. You should do it, and here's, some, here's, here's a short way to pray, which is the Lord's Prayer. It's a kind of short version of something to pray. And I think when I hear people say, like, how should I, you know, do it in a way to kind of get the thing I'm answering for, it's almost like if I were to come to you, and I've had people do this before, um, can you can, can you uh, do me a favor? And then they don't want to tell me what the favor or is. Or they say, what are you doing next Saturday? Yes. Mm-hmm. Or they say, can I ask you a question and you not tell anyone about it? Or can I tell you something but it not, but it not go to anybody else? And every time I think, I would like to know what it is before I answer this question. Because what you're about to say is going to influence what my answer or what I'm going to do with the information or what any of that is. Because, and what I often know, and I'll just tell you this, I've never had my wife come and do that to me. 
I've never, I've never had one of you come to me and say, I'm going to tell you something you can't ever tell anybody about this. <laughs> if you did, I'd go, why are you carrying a shovel? Like, <laughs> why are we having, I've never had someone I'm in a close relationship with do that because yeah. they trust that I will do something in their good with the information. Now, I have had former students go, hey, I need, I need to talk to you about something, but you can't ever tell anyone. You can do that. I go, then that's not going to work for me. Because it's not relational at that point. And I know both of I, I would assume both of you have been in similar situations where it feels like before the conversation is starting, it feels like you're trying to trap me in something. Mm. And I feel like I tend to say to people when they ask me, can I tell you something and you keep it confidential? I said It depends. I, that's what that's I what I, I, said. I yes. say it depends. You can trust me to try to handle it appropriately. But my point is <laughs> even that is relational. Because it requires a level of trust in the person or whatever the thing is. And I'm not trying to go down the rabbit hole on that. My point is, I think when Jesus says this, it is in the context of a greater mysterious relationship between us and God where he's saying, hey, this is, he's not saying this is exactly how prayer works. He's saying, imagine if you had the kind of relationship with God where you could just talk to your heavenly father and you trusted, you did it in such a way you trusted, he's gonna move things. He could, in, in this, because I think it's imaginary, he'd move mountains yeah. to do good in your favor. It's an invitation, it is not an explanation of yeah. how prayer works. And I often feel like, and I'm not criticizing, because I, I know where your question came from. I, I'm not saying that you're asking it with this motive, but I often feel like when people ask me questions about prayer, it's as if they're like, well, I feel like there's some things in the Bible that say I can get whatever I want in prayer, but that's not my experience. Sure. So either I'm doing it wrong, or maybe God was wrong, or Jesus was wrong, whoever said the, you know, the words about prayer, and they're trying to figure that out. I feel like there's always that hint of manipulation. One well, I have it on other. both ways. I have some people who read it and go, I know that can't be what God means sure. because it hasn't been my thing. So can you help me? Because I want to trust what Jesus says, right. but it certainly, because it does sound like that. It does. If I just read that verse, it sounds like you can ask for anything. If you, you just read the verse. Well, that's right. That's right. So, but I mean, you take that, but then I know people on the other side who go, what do I need to say to make it happen? Yeah, and and yeah. either way, there are people yeah. who don't trust it or people are going, what do I need to do? So maybe we should read the entire context at this point. Well, the context is the cursing of the fig tree. If you don't know about that, Jesus is walking in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. He sees a fig tree that should have figs on it. Though, one of the translations says it's not the season for figs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Jesus yeah, it does say in Mark, it says, but there were only leaves because it was too early in the season for fruit. So for some reason, it upsets Jesus that this fig tree that shouldn't have figs doesn't have figs. Yeah, yeah. So that's a mystery in and of itself, right there. Uh, well, there's a lot of debate. I think we talked about this before. There's a lot of debate on even why he did it and what it meant. That's right. Like he was trying to show them a, a literal right. word or a, an, an image of something he wanted to teach. Well, them. yeah. There's we don't have to, and that's no. not your question, but no. there, there is a part about Israel being represented uh -huh. as a yes. fig tree and all of that. Then he goes into the temple. Yeah, and so cleanses the temple and all that, and then they notice it on the way back. So that. That may be the context of all of this. We don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of debate around that. And then when they come back from cleansing the temple, they see the fig tree is, in withered fact, up. withered up. Yep. And they say to Jesus. Peter uh, notices it, it says, and he says, Look, Rabbi, the fig tree you cursed has withered and died. And then Jesus says, and here's the whole quote. He says, Have faith in God. I tell you the truth. You can say to this mountain, May you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will happen. But you must really believe it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. I tell you, you can pray for anything, and if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. But when you're praying, first forgive anyone you're holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. Mm. And you mentioned... That part wasn't in their devotion. No. <laughs> Interestingly <laughs> enough. <laughs> no. So, Which is I, not a criticism of you. It's to your yeah. point of you know that's out of context. Mm -hmm. It's just one verse. Well, yes. I think the interesting part is as well, even the part that starts it was, I'm guessing, wasn't in the devotional, where Jesus' original statement, which is often, and this happens to us too, when you teach, 
you often start by saying what you're going to say. Mm -hmm. Jesus says, have faith in God. Yep. Yes. That's it. Mm -hmm. If you put your faith in God, mm -hmm. he says, you. what's the rest of the statement? I tell you the truth, you can say to a mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it'll happen. So Jesus <laughs> says, if you trust God, I mean, if you really believe God, not it's not your faith that will move the mountain. If you believe God wants a mountain moved, he'll do it. He'll do it. Mm -hmm. And then you just ask him, and he'll do what you already know he promised to do. But isn't this true? You brought up this point, Ed, but I, I think all three of us would agree with this point. When you speak and try to teach, as we do our church, you say what you want to say, like you, you mentioned, and then you give sometimes very hyperbolic examples oh, yeah. to try and drive the point home so that people will really understand what you're saying. I think that's a lot of what Jesus is doing here, because I don't think... Jesus intended for them to think, oh, let's go go throw a mountain into the ocean. Yeah, I'll have a lot of people, well, not a lot, but there are several people I know of that if I say in a message, and I still do it because it is the right way to teach a crowd when you say, everyone, and yes. they'll go, well, not not me. Not that ain't ever happened to me, buddy. I don't know who I you're talking about, one. everyone. Yeah. Everything you're going to say after this I, point. I can't listen to anything else because yes. that doesn't apply to me. Well, you know, I was talking to a lot of a people. Generalized, That's right. A general. Yes. And it's the way it's the way we, I, I feel. So that'll that'll soften the <laughs> everyone. I feel it's the way most human beings communicate. We come back from a an event. Well, how many people were there? Oh, everyone was there. Yeah. Or oh, this was happening. Oh, this is. And you're not. No one. I don't think <laughs> any teenager who comes back and goes, "Can I go to this party?" Well, who's all going? Everyone's going. I don't even think the teenager thinks you think. Literally all 4,000 students who go to East Coweta High School are going to be in this one house. Right. They're trying to say, everyone who matters to me is going right. to be there. Yeah. And they assume that you know the difference between the two. So I think that import, it's important for us to, because this has been, and this may not even be what you mean. I think a lot, there is a big thing in our world of faith is a power that I can use for yes. whatever I want to use. It's a power that I direct at things, and it's yeah. a power within me. And if I can believe it, and people take verses like this to say, Jesus is also saying there's a force in my ability to believe something. But what Jesus means, what the Bible means by faith, faith is in, it's the object of your faith that matters. Yeah. It's not my ability. That's why Jesus can say, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, a tiny little, if you just have a tiny little bit of faith in a great big God, it can be done. But having an enormous amount of faith in something that doesn't exist, your enormous amount of faith doesn't matter. That's right. It's, it's the faith, it's the object of your faith, which is why he starts with, if you, be, if you have faith in God. And let's be clear, the word faith is loaded. It, it in, is. In our, in our day and in our culture, it, it is more of a leaning trust. It is. In the object, whatever right. you are trusting in. So again, that is, I don't want to say the word is passive, but in, in do you our, know what I'm saying? Yeah. It, it's, well, it's relational it's, for sure. It's, it's it is word definitely faith, relational. It's, definitely. it's a trusting relationship. I was just recently talking, not about this exact verse, but as you look in the, well, and even with, I was going to say, if you look at all the Gospels, but even within the Gospels, there are times where Jesus teaches, like in Matthew in particular, he'll teach one thing, you know, in Matthew 4 or 5, and, well, 5 is the Sermon on the Mount, but he'll teach something around 3 or 4, and then he'll teach the same thing again in, in chapter 12, because he, he's an itinerant preacher, he's traveling a lot, so he's saying a lot of these things again. And one that's similar is, he says this thing for of, if you ask, you will receive. And mm -hmm. then in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, you ask, you seek, you knock, and he's mm -hmm. talking about this perpetual, ongoing asking and seeking and knocking. And I was talking about this with a group of people about prayer in particular. I said, I used to struggle a lot with prayer because I couldn't figure out why God wanted me to ask. You know, because yeah. God knows what it, he says. He knows what he you knows need what before you, you need. pray it. And it also tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says he's just making the rain and the sun fall on people. God's generous. He's just giving us things all the time. So if God's really generous, he knows what I need. Why would I ever have to ask? Why is he not just handing me stuff? And if I'm asking, is that me manipulating God because I want to ask for it? And I said, because I think prayer is an invitation. It's I don't even know that this answer, answers it. My, my number one thing to this is just pray 
And maybe as you pray, you'll, you'll figure more and more of it out. But what I said was the more I've prayed and the more I've experienced asking God for things, my experience has been uh, that it's not different than a father, as Jesus says, and once a kid asks you for something. Right. And the story I told him was I said, often when we go to Aldi on Fridays, me and my kids and my wife, we go to Aldi to get groceries. If you've ever been to Aldi, they often have these little limited, uh, limited time batches of stuff. Mm-hmm. And they'll have cookies often that are just like this, you know, different kind of cookie that they have. So I'll always pick them up because they're like $1.50. dollar fifty. I'm like, let's let's get one of these and we'll come home. Well, I got four girls, so I have to divvy up for them how many cookies they get. Now I want them to have cookies. But I also want some of the cookies, so I'm divvying up how many they get, so I still get some. And occasionally, I have one daughter in particular, and she's a charmer. It's her nature. After she gets the three or four cookies, she still occasionally will come to Dad and go, can I have another Yeah, you got an extra there? And many of the times, not all the times, sometimes I go, no, I've already eaten all the cookies. (laughs) But occasionally, I'll go, of course. And it moves my heart that she's just being so sweet, she's being so cute about it. I give it to her. And then I'll watch that I have other daughters who will watch that she got a cookie and never come ask me for the cookie. And then occasionally will get mad at me and her that she got an additional cookie and I did. Why did I not get a cookie? My answer is, you didn't, you didn't ask. ask. I gave you, I'm, I'm a good father and I generously already gave you things. But there is a relational aspect of, she just knows daddy wants to give it and if you just kind of push on him a little bit. He's a little bit of a pushover. He, he wants to give you the good thing. You just kind of ask. And my wife and I talk about this regularly because three of our children are foster children. And I've said this before about discipleship is mainly about what you have to unlearn. And for our girls, they have a lot of things in their brain that think you shouldn't ask for things. You should just go take them. If you need some, you go get it. Don't ask because anyone's going to get it. And a part of us parenting them and helping them to grow is to help them understand the way the world works is you ask and you trust that the people who love you, they want to help you. They want to be, don't, don't take the world on your own and think, I'm going to fix it. I'll get it. If I need something, I'll work harder or I'll be sneakier about it or I'll do this to go get it. Now, this is the preaching part and you flip it over. How many of us have learned through life, if I need something, I'm going to get it. And if I really need, if I need help with something, I got to work harder and I got to do this. And our father is going, Hey, look, I've already provided you. Who gave you the breath in your life? Well, and I'll yeah. say this, Nathan, the other preaching part of that, that I'll just pipe in on that. My experience with most of us in our culture, which is a individualistic, you need to stand on your own two feet, you need to get it how you can get it, mm-hmm. is that most of us only come to prayer for things that we can't get on our right. own. Yeah. And then when we don't get it with verses like this, we really are confused. It sounds like I should be able to just ask and get it, but I did ask one time and I didn't get I didn't. it. Didn't get it. So either I didn't ask right or this doesn't mean what it means. I think the the benefit of your illustration, I'll just try to get to where I was thinking about as you're doing it is your girls already trust that you want the best for them. Right. They know you have cookies available, and that cookies are a good thing for them, or you wouldn't have given them to them in the first right. place. Many, many, many people I have met in my life get to a place where they want something. They haven't been able to get it. They read a verse like this, and they presume that God wants for them what they want for them. They can't see somewhere that God hasn't promised them what they want. Yeah. They, they just presume, if I want it, mm-hmm. and I think it's good, it must then be good. it must be good, and God, who is good, would want what I think is good, mm-hmm. where in truth, God may know that good for you as an individual lies on the backside of you unlearning something that you thought was good, that in fact was not good for you. Well, and to, oh, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. I was just going to say, and to, and to, so to take that further, we've already said sometimes you ask and you don't get it. The part I said on the next part was, and there are other times where I've already given them three or four cookies. I've already blessed them with what they need. And someone comes and says, can I have this? And I know because I'm their dad, we're about to eat dinner in a little Mm -hmm. bit after this. And because the, or the last time they ate that many cookies, they threw up. Yeah, okay, yeah, there's something that, that was right. right, yeah. Or so, and so, but what I do, because I'm a good father, is I sit with them and I go, now let me explain. The answer is no. That's right. Here's why the answer is no. 
And I, but that's because I have even better things that are coming and I'm going to do all this. What my experience has been is that my younger, more immature children, it don't matter what explanation I give them. No. The moment I said no, they go, great, mm. and they walk away, and they're mad. You know, they might listen to it, and they go away. But occasionally, my older kids, and I've had them say this, I have one, my oldest daughter regularly will go, well, I know you're doing that because we've got dinner coming, and I know that I'll get another treat at another time, and it'll work this way. My point illustrating that is, in my experience, often, because the only kind of prayer we do is, I come to you once every couple weeks when I really need something, mm -hmm. And I expect the answer is coming. I do believe God is answering it in that moment, but I do not have ears to hear because all I'm because I only come to you because as I mentioned, I have a couple daughters in particular that they don't ever ask, and occasionally they get up the courage to ask. But it's been six hours since we had the cookies, and the cookies are all gone. And I'll say, well, no, we can't do it. And they go, well, why did I ask? I asked. Well, I go, well, we don't have. It's not happening anymore. We're past that time. They don't have ears to hear the explanation. But the more our relationship grows and the more they ask, and sometimes they get yes and sometimes they get no, their, their heart grows. And they do, like we said, they understand my dad loves me. He cares about me. If he's saying no, even if I don't, and I'm not saying they don't like it when I say no. And that's okay. And I, as a dad, am not mad at them. I would have to be a pretty petty dad. To when I say no to them and they're mad at me, as they often are, that I said no, for me to go, well, now I'm mad at you. <laughs> I'm yeah. mad at you. God is not mad at us when we get frustrated. The answer is no. Yeah. But I know my daughters will keep asking and will keep having this conversation. But and That's the relationship. Because it's a relationship. That's, and they don't have power over me with their faith. But there is something that as our relationship grows, you know, my heart grows for them, their heart grows for me. We have this just relational context that it works. And I think that's what Jesus is trying to do is to say, you have a good father. Imagine a world where you could look at a mountain. Because what we don't see is there's nowhere in the New Testament. I'm not saying they didn't try. There's nowhere in the New Testament where Peter goes, guys, look, I got to get to the other side of this mountain. Let's just move the mountain. <laughs> well, and let's be clear, the, the disciples tried this. I mean, there were many times, I'm thinking of specifically when uh, they got angry at the town that rejected them, right, and they came yeah. to Jesus and said, Jesus, you want us to call down fire? I know you can do it. Right. I know we can do that. They had faith that God could call down fire and they destroy people. Happen. And Jesus goes, you don't even get it. Yeah, you don't get it. You're and missing and so point. again, back to your point, the, the, uh, the faith was not the problem right. in that moment. It was well, their their faith in themselves to get God to do something. Yes. Yeah, was that was out, out, of his was out of his character. They just didn't understand who God exactly. was. Exactly. They were so still they, growing. They and had we've a said it, idea. I think we've said it on this podcast, or at least we've taught this. Prayer is your relationship with it God. Is. And I, yes. And back right. to what you were saying, Nathan, I am finding, because I, I feel like I have grown more in my prayer life this past couple of years than I have in a long, long time. And what I'm experiencing these days is my prayer life is constantly uh, trying to catch up with God's uh, provision yes, that's uh, right. of my life. Because like you said, he's always just blessing. He's always giving good gifts. And, and I'm just constantly trying to get my prayers up to par with what he's already doing in, in my life, much less the stuff that I, I think I need more than that. As I have aligned myself with the will of God, and what I mean by that is if I've understood the, who God is more and more, mm -hmm. and I've been willing to pray what I know God is already, you know, show me what you're doing. I want to join in with what you're doing. I'm not asking you to get on my, my plan anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are things I want, and I'll, I'll say that to him, but my main plans are show me where you're doing, what I can do, how I can get involved. I'm seeing God at work more than I have. I am in the same place. Mm -hmm. The last couple of years, I have become more aware of the power of prayer than I have in many, many, many years. Mm -hmm. But it's and really more, because mm -hmm. I'm praying in faith. I'm yes. praying that, that yes. I'm praying, trusting that he will do everything he said he would do. And he's, there's a place where Jesus says, if you pray, your heavenly Father will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. Yeah, and, and you're so you to, should ask for that. And you're able to pray things like, for instance, the other day I had a friend who was going through a hard time. She was asking me for prayer, um, a specific answer. Um, to she was uh, 
thought she might be really, really sick. And she wanted me to pray that when she goes to the doctor, that the test would come back right. clean. I wanted that. Right. I knew it was a good thing, but I knew God had never promised me nor her that you're going to go through life without having this sickness. Right. That That is not promised to her. So when I prayed for my friend, I went to God and said, I know you never promised you'd do this specific thing. Right. I didn't say it this way, but in my heart, this is what I'm thinking. That's what you were thinking. I was in my heart thinking, God, I know you never said you'd specifically do this for my friend, but I really want this to happen. Right. And I, I know you have the ability to do it. And if in your wisdom you see fit to do it, I trust that you can and that you might. Right. And I'm I place my friend in your in your hands. And I know that even if this doesn't turn out the way I want it to, that there's enough grace and there's enough love in my relationship with you and for your relationship with her that all can be made well. Right, that's right. And I trust it. Now, good news, he answered the prayer. Mm-hmm. And then it was like, oh, that was cool. Yeah, look at, look at what right. God did. And did he do it because I asked? Did he do it because my friend asked? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. But here's what I do know. I knew I experienced growth in my relationship with, with Jesus. Right. I believe she did as well. And it was a moment, and I think he could have done it either way. That's right. That's but exactly right. But because I was willing to talk to him about it and be honest with him about it and just trust him through it, faith grew. Yeah. And the relationship is 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 better for it. Well, and if you just accept, you know, the part you said of, I don't know, did God make the test results come back because I prayed? Yeah. Had he already done that? Yes. Was this already at work before anyone even prayed? Well, and the truth was, there was no sickness there. We just thought there might be. That's what I'm saying. Is you, and and you so don't the know. prayer was probably answered long before I ever or you all, But this is what I've said to other people. You don't know that the sickness was there and God didn't take That's it away. That's right. I don't what know. What you don't know, and this is the point, I think this is what Jesus is trying to get into this. Is In our modern world, we think life is is. A mystery in the sense that it's waiting for me or science or someone smarter than me to solve it all. And one day we will get to a place where life won't be a mystery. It's an algorithm that I just got to put things in and I'll be able to live to 150 and I'll be fine and I'll be able to have all these things and life will go as I want it to go. You put your money in this account and it grows to this account. You do this and this and then you know people who did put their money in the right place. And things didn't go exactly the way they wanted to. Or they did all the health things they were supposed to. Mm -hmm. Some genetic nightmare happened that that no one could have seen coming. And what I always say is life by itself is pretty mysterious. Yes, there are principles with which the world operates. Uh, My philosophy professor would even say most of the things, and I just recently heard a scientist say this, most of the things we call laws are only laws because they've worked that way up to this point. Yeah. Right. There and may be a possibility not. that they're not a law. They've just worked this way for 6,000 years or however That's many thousands of years we've been studying. That's it. Right. All those things. And my point is that there is an open-handed way to live, which is the way Jesus taught me to live, which is to say, I ask for everything. Then everything that comes in, I see as either a blessing to praise God for or an opportunity to go up to him one more time in prayer. But either way, mm-hmm. he is the prize that I'm going to. Yes. When the blessing comes and the healing comes, it should be an opportunity for me to praise God and say, oh, mm-hmm. thank you, that it grew my trust in you it like did. it did for you. It did. Or if it didn't go the way I wanted, I go, oh, God, now, ooh, now I get a chance to now trust you to again because I need you because I need you on this side. That's right. And either way, he is what we wanted most mm-hmm. out of it anyway. Yes. But the only way to do that is to trust, I have a father, he's listening, he wants me to ask him for things, and he's ready to give me good things. And the good thing may be the healing, or the good thing may be a deeper relationship with him, but either one draws me closer. It's the way it's supposed to work. Yeah. Hopefully. (laughs) You know, the other part I always think about, particularly when we're praying about things that are in our short span of life here that don't go the way we want them to, is... uh, you know, a part of our faith is is that this really is, you know, it's, a, a baby's nine months in the womb, they're hidden away, it's all a mystery to most of us what's going on, we don't remember it, any of that kind of stuff. This life at one point will be like those nine months in the womb. It just may be 90, 70, 80 sure. years, yeah. whatever it is, mm-hmm. but 
I got to believe when we're 10,000, you know, years in eternity, nobody's going to look back and go, you know, I asked God for something when I was 62. Yeah. And that didn't go the way I wanted it to. Yeah. It's just going to be another one of those things. You know, I'm at the place in life where I know lots of people that are dying, lots of people that are sick, because that's just part when you get older. Yeah. You know lots of those things. And, you know, particularly for those of us who are Christians, no matter how much you pray, what we've been preparing ourselves is to be out of this body and present with the Lord until we're all back together where, where we're going to be in the final, mm-hmm. final state. And I always think of the little story of the, you know, uh, the guy in Sunday school has asking the kids, how do you get to heaven? And they're all giving answers. And finally, one of the kids says, you got you to be die. dead. <laughs> you got to be dead. You can't go to heaven if you're not dead. And we all want to act like I can have heaven here by getting prayers and doing all the stuff I want. But, you know, you got you got to be dead. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note. <laughs> you know, so ultimately that's, yeah. you know. Yeah. I, I, but that, too, is a good father that told me I have faith that that's a part of his promise, too. He's taking care of that. Well, yeah. That's all. Every place I am, including the last moments of my life, is a perfectly safe place for a follower of Christ to be. Follower of Christ ain't going to taste death. That's right. That's right. That's what we've been promised. That's right. So, so I, tr- I trust that's true. So it's, me safe, too. For, it's safe for me, me too. to stop breathing air on this planet. It's all good. All right. So next week, tune in when we are going to talk about demon possession. Wait. Aren't All you right. excited about talking about Nemo? I am I, not, but I'll do it. I'm ready. We will do it because you asked it. <laughs> we just watched a movie yesterday about demon possession. Uh-huh. So I'm ready. I am educated I, and ready to go. I bet it's nothing like that. No. Well, we're going to find out. We'll find <laughs> out. So y'all keep sending questions like that in, and we will answer them. The link is in the description as always. And until next week, have a good one. See ya. <laughs>